We are back. Give a couple minutes for people to jump in, and we are going to get started. Whew. What's up to everybody that's coming in? Hey, y'all. All right. All right. Well, I guess we can start. Well, Happy New Year, everybody. We are back with our Anna Chronicles. As usual, we are continuing to spread the word of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. But, uh... Yes, this is our first message of the year. I'm excited for what God is going to do this year, what he's already doing. We see there's a shift taking place. Um, some people are very discouraged right now about what's taking place in the world. You know, we see a lot happening as we start off the new year. But for me, I am not worried. I am standing on faith. God is in control. I don't put my faith in a man. I don't put my faith in an election. But my faith is in Jesus Christ, and that is what I'm standing on. I'm standing on the Word of God. I'm standing on my faith. I do not need to put my trust in a man. Amen? So what is happening right now does not faze me. Amen? I am standing on truth. I'm standing on faith. And I'm standing on the Word of God. And this is the place we need to get back to, is when everything around you is crumbling. We can put our faith in God, amen? When we've done all that we can do, we just stand, amen? This is what the Bible tells us. When you've done all you can do, you just stand, amen? I don't know about you, but for me, I fasted, I prayed, I've done what Second Chronicles seven fourteen tells us to do, to humble ourselves, turn from our wicked ways, you know, to fast and pray. And, and now we've done this, now it's our job to just stand on our faith, stand and trust God for being God, amen? And this is where we are in this nation, this is where we are in this time. It is time for us to get back to the feet of Jesus, amen? And this is where I really want to talk about today is our strength, because us as humans, we put our strength and we put our faith into so many different things that I believe it grieves God. And God is calling us to, to put back our faith in him and put back our eyes on him to look to him for strength. Because the Bible says in Nehemiah that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. So if we know that the joy of the Lord is our strength, we're not going to have to look to the world. We're not going to have to look to a man. We're not going to have to look to anybody for strength but God. Amen. And I believe God is calling us to come back to a place of um, humility to sit at his feet. Amen. And to gain strength from him. Amen. We are we know about the story with Martha and Mary and and how um, Mary was so worried about doing material things. And Martha just st stood. I mean, Martha was the one doing material things and Mary was just at the feet of Jesus um, listening and and gaining strength and gaining wisdom and gaining the things that God desired to give her. And and Martha, you know, told Jesus, tell Mary to come help me. But. Jesus told her, you need to be more like Mary. And and a lot of times we need to sit down, you know, and stop worrying and, and get and not get out of your seat. Amen. A lot of times when we get out of our seat, we are standing out of our position. Amen. God has called us to be seated in heavenly places with him. And when you sit, you know, you're sitting in a seat of authority. You're sitting in a seat of of position and when you get out of that seat out of worry when you get out of that seat in 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 fear you are getting out of your position amen so we got to position ourselves back at the feet of Jesus so we can gain strength from him amen and we're not going to worry we're not going to think that works is going to save us we're not going to get to a place where we're going we think we have to do this we have to do that we have to do this do do we have to do 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 to gain salvation or gain the blessings of God, but rather rest in his presence. Amen. I really feel that for the church and for America in this season, those who to not give into fear, 
You know, I've talked to a lot of people um, over the past couple of days and there's so much doubt that I'm hearing like, oh, it's over, you know, this and that. And we feel like it's over, but I am secure in who God is. I'm secure in the word of God. I don't believe that a spirit of lies have come in the mouths of the prophets. I am standing on faith and I'm sitting in my position in, he in a heavenly place with God to know that his word will never return void. Amen. And I really believe it's because we get discouraged and we get, you know, fearful when we get out of our position. Amen. And God is telling us to sit down and get back into our position in heavenly places of authority. And this is where I believe God is leading us in this nation. I believe God is setting us up for the greatest revival that this world has ever seen. The, the last great revival between, but before the coming of Jesus. And I don't want to miss it. Amen. I want to be a part of what God is getting ready to do. But we have to stay in our position. Amen. A soldier cannot leave his post without reprimand, without um, being uh, reprimanded. He cannot leave his post without without um, being uh, chastised. You know what I mean? And we cannot leave our post. We have to stand in our position of authority because we are soldiers. God is calling us to take our position and not abandon our post. Amen. We are to endure hardness through this time. It may look like things have gone off, but we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. This is time for us to stand and, and sit, stand in our faith and sit at the feet of Jesus. Sit in the position that God has called you in a heavenly place and take your authority and gain your strength from Jesus as we are sitting in our place of position in him. Amen. And even in even um, uh, Revelation talks about when we overcome, we are seated with him on his throne and we have to overcome this this fear. We have to overcome this worry. We have to overcome the things that are trying to take us away from Jesus. Amen. And when we overcome these things, now you'll be secure in that th in your place of position in the throne of God with Jesus. Amen. All right. That is not what I came on here to talk about, but I felt led to say that. Amen. But today we're going to be talking about the Isaiah. Amen. This is one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. One of my favorite prophets. Um, I love the book Isaiah. It has so much information, so much wisdom. And um, this is a word that's been stirring in me for months now that God wants me to, one, I believe, wants me to share as we are entering into the new year. Amen. But let's open up in prayer first. Amen. So, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for all that you're doing, God, and we thank you for bringing us into a new year with our health, God, with the activity of our limbs. God, with a voice that we can give you praise in Jesus' name, God. And we just lift up this time with you, God, to have your way. God, push me to the side and allow your spirit, God, to move freely. God, I surrender myself, God, that you would let the uh, words of my lips and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. God, and I just pray, God, through this word to, that it would touch our hearts to know that we don't have to look to the world for strength, God, but we can gain strength from you. When we look at you to be high and lifted up, God, as Isaiah did, God, God, your glory will come and fill the temple, God. So we pray that we will put our eyes on you today, God, and your glory can come and fill our lives. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are going to be reading a familiar passage that a lot of people know. You know, I just quoted it in my prayer as well, but from Isaiah 6. And this is when Isaiah saw God high and lifted up, amen? So I'm going to start reading in Isaiah 6. I'm only going to read a couple of scriptures and then talk about it and then go back and read it, all right? So Isaiah 6, 1 starts and says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered, with two, twain, he covered his face. And with two he covered his feet. And with two he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Amen. So I'm going to start. I'm going to stop right there, and we're going to talk about this, and then we'll just move on. But it was in the year that King Uzziah died that that Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. Right. So it was the year. It was the death of King Uzziah, and it was a tragedy. A death of a king is a tragedy. And it was a tragedy to Isaiah because even though King Uzziah wasn't perfect, he did do good in the sight of the Lord in some areas. And he did bring Judah back towards God. And we see that in Second Chronicles chapter 26. And since Uzziah did good in the sight of the Lord, it would be natural for Isaiah to look at this man as an example. And look at this man to put his trust in him to bring a revival that would prevent the wrath of God over the, 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 the kingdom of Judah. And But God had other plans, right? And the key here is to not put your trust in a man. To not put your full confidence in a man, right? And, and, a, and the flesh of a man, because the Bible also says to see no man after the flesh. And sometimes we put our confidence in a man and now we start to worship the man instead of worshiping the God in the man. And it was the year that King Uzziah died that now Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. And it, this all became very real in the year that he died, that God, that Isaiah um, now had a vision of heaven, right? And the thing is, is that Isaiah knew the Lord before King Uzziah died, but now there's a new level of intimacy when King Uzziah died. You know, sometimes we know about Jesus, but it takes a tragedy. It takes something happening in our lives to really see God at that point. It takes a death of a loved one. It takes us going through an addiction. It takes us um, going through a trial and a tribulation to gain that intimacy with God, to really know him as a healer, to really know him as a deliverer, to really know him as a way maker or a provider in our lives. And, you know, even when King Uzziah died, you know, even though a king was dead, the king of kings was still alive. And God was giving um, Isaiah a example here. That even though you may have seen this man as a king, Uzziah, in your eyes, and even though he may have died, I am the king of kings and I'm still alive, right? And, you know, sometimes for us, we may see a death of a situation or a death of a loved one, or we may see a circumstance in our lives um, we may see a tragedy in that area, but God is still saying, look, I'm still alive. I'm still well. I am still here. I'm your salvation. I'm your light. Whom shall you fear? Because God is still alive, right? And the thing is here is Uzziah literally means is my strength is Yah, right? So Uzziah means my strength is Yah. So when I think of Uzziah, I think of strength, right? And But the thing is, is it took... Isaiah's strength to die before he could see the Lord high and lifted up. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. So it was the year that his strength died. That that's when then he saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. So my question for you today is, in 2020, what was your strength? And entering into the new year of 2021, what is your strength? You know, because we see in 2020, everything that gave us strength was stripped from us. You know, with COVID, we saw that jobs were stripped with us. You know, sometimes depending on the government was stripped from us. We saw that, um, that men you know, in positions was stripped from us. We saw that churches that sometimes we put strength in was stripped from us. And the thing is, is that um, what is your strength today that is not God, that you're putting your trust in? You know, and a lot of people will look at these things and say, well, this is a work of the enemy, right? Which it is. God does not bring, God did not create COVID. 
God did not create riots. God did not create division. But the thing is, is that God works all things together for the good. So God allows all things to happen for a reason. And I truly believe that through the year of 2020, through God stripping us of all these things, he is showing us the true content of our heart. And the question, the question is, is what have you been putting your trust in? What have you been putting your strength in? You know, like Isaiah, this event needed to happen so that he could now not only know about the Lord, but now he could actually see God for himself. You know, even in 2020, a lot of us only saw God through our pastors. A lot of us only saw God through our churches. Me, I, I'm an example of that. A lot of us only saw God through going to church. But in 2020, God even stripped us of all of our churches. So now we were forced to seek God on our own. And I truly believe this is what happened here with, with Isaiah. You know, this event needed to happen. So now he could not only know about the Lord, but he could see God for himself, you know, and so that he could have that new intimacy with Jesus. And the thing is, is that it is until the things that we put our strength in dies. That's now when we can see the Lord high and lifted up and his train of the glory of God can now fill the temple. You know, the things that we look to for strength, whether it be false comfort, whether it be a substance, whether it be a drug, whether it be a person, whatever it is that's bringing you strength, when that thing dies, now the glory of God can come in and fill your life. Because the thing that you're looking for for strength is taking residence in your heart. But now when you allow that thing to die, when you put that thing to death, when you deny that thing that's given you strength, that's given you a false strength, now God can come in. Now you can see God for who he is. And now his glory, his presence, and his, his love can come in and fill your heart, right? And the question is, the question when I ask you is, what has your eyes been on? Because it's when God, when King Uzziah died, that's when God, when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. So I want to ask you, what has your eyes been on? You know, are you watching things that you should, and I'm going to say we, because I'm going to put me in this too. Have we been watching things that we shouldn't be watching? You know, are we looking at trends and dances and TikToks and all these things and are we submitting ourselves to the culture of the world to try and keep up with them, you know? Are our eyes on someone else's gift and someone else's talent and someone else's anointing that we start to lust after that um, and out of jealousy? Is that where our eyes are, you know? Are your eyes on a man or a woman to give you fulfillment through sex, through a relationship, through, you know, false comfort? Or is your eyes on another person to give you a fulfillment that only God can give you? You know, is your eyes on a church? Is it on a pastor? Is it on a minister? Is it on someone that is dictating your life with God or, 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 or trying to have a, are you looking at a pastor? Like I said earlier to, to, to give you a relationship with God. I'll say it that way. Or even is your eyes even on your past or on an incident or something that's happened in your past that is making you relive the pain? You know, where is your eyes today? Or is your eyes on God? You know, we have to learn to take the focus off of the created thing. You know, we have to learn how to take our eyes off of the natural realm, off of circumstances, off of situations, off of problems, off of people. We have to learn to take our eyes off of the created thing and now put our eyes on the creator of all things, which is Jesus. I'm going to say that again. We got to learn how to take our eyes off of the created thing. And now put our eyes on the creator of all things. You know, even even earlier this week, I was having a um, talk with one of my friends. And, you know, he asked me, he was like, Jordan, what is what is something I can do to conquer the addiction to pornography? And literally when um, because these are things I need to study, you know, being a pastor and things like that, I have to know how to answer questions and stuff. So when I spend time with God, God will speak to me in areas about things like this. And this is a conversation I've had with the Lord a, um, a, a while ago about 
God, what can we do to conquer an addiction? What can we do to conquer, you know, things that we look to for false comfort and all those things? And literally God said the simplest thing. And, and even for this person, I told them, take your eyes off of the pornography and put your eyes on Jesus. You know, that's as simple as it is. Taking your eyes off of that thing and now putting your eyes on God. And that's the thing with anything that you're struggling with. We feed it by putting our eyes on it. We feed it by constantly dwelling on it. You know, the Bible says your eyes is the window to your soul. So when you're constantly thinking, when you're constantly looking at something that is not bringing glory to God or feeding or edifying your spirit at all, you're, you're entertaining something that's demonic. And God is telling us today to take your eyes off of the physical Take your eyes off of the things that are giving you fear. Take your eyes off of the media, off of the news, off of social media, off of things that are, are not edifying your spirit. Take your eyes off of that and put your eyes on Jesus. That is how, as simple as it is, is you shifting your focus off of the thing that is not bringing you life and now putting your eyes on the thing, which is Jesus, that can now bring you life, right? And that's the thing that conquered the addictions in my life. You know, with alcohol and all these different things, lust and all these things, it literally, that was the answer. It took, I took my eyes off of the thing that my eyes shouldn't have been on and now refocused my eyes to Jesus. And that is what brought you, that's what brought me deliverance. And that's the same thing for anybody. You have to force yourself to keep your eyes on Jesus. Because let me tell you, this flesh, the Bible says that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your flesh is always going to fight you. Your flesh wants to be satisfied. Your flesh wants you to give in to them temptations of the world. But this is a war. You have to fight with the spirit. You have to fight yourself and literally renew your mind with the word and cast down those thoughts that come into you and literally say, no, Satan, no, devil, I'm not doing this. Get behind me. I am going to stand on the word of God. I'm going to stand on my faith and I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus. Amen. And this is where God is calling us. I truly believe that. And the thing is, is that we got to take and shift our eyes from the temporal on the, and now shift it from the temporal to the eternal, right? Because let me tell you, the Bible says our life is as a vapor and it's, we're going to vanish away. This, everything on this earth is temporal. Everything is temporal. This is, this is, this is all going to die, right? Everything on this earth. So why am I going to put my trust in something that's going to die? I need to put my trust in Jesus. And even the Bible says not to lay up your treasures where moth and dust can rust. That means why are we, why are we working to save all this money? Why are we working to store up our treasures here on this earth when all of that is going to die? We should be doing a work for the kingdom to store up treasures in heaven where moth and dust cannot take over and rust. And this is the thing. We got to take our focus off of this natural realm. We got to take our focus off of what we can feed ourselves in this natural realm and focus our eyes on God and be like, God, what can I do for you? Amen. Hey, Auntie Sherry, love you. Happy New Year. And this is where God wants us to really be is to take our focus off of what we're seeing with these eyes and now see out of this eye, the eyes of our heart, the eyes of, because this is where our, you know, this is where God dwells in our heart. So now we got to take our eyes off of what we see here. And now go based off of what God is showing us in our heart through the word of God. Amen. And I, and you know, the thing is, is that if we stay focused in what's happening in the natural realm, you know, we are going to miss out on what God is doing in the spirit realm. You know, if we continue, I truly believe if we continue to focus on the division on the world, if we continue to focus on COVID, if we continue to focus on, on the corruption and crap of this election, if we continue to just focus on these material things and not stand in our faith in God concerning these things and, and, and fight these things out of the natural realm, if we continue to do that, we are going to miss out on revival. I truly believe that. We are going to miss out on what God is doing in the spiritual realm if we keep our eyes focused on this natural realm. And the thing is, is that we have to press towards the mark of the high calling, which is Jesus. Philippians 3.14, this is where we have to keep our focus. You know, when you're running a race, you, keep, you are keeping your eyes 
on that prize till you win the finish line. This is what our lives is. Our lives is like a race like Ecclesiastes talks about. The race is not given to the swift or the strong, but to those that endure. You have to learn how to endure through your problems. You have to learn how to endure through your situations. Through your ungodly mindsets, you're going to have to cast them down and endure. Amen. God is calling us to press towards the mark. Keep your eyes on the prize, which is Jesus. Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus and watch God do a work in your life. Amen. And the thing is, God is not only interested in getting you to heaven. Amen. I'm just saying that God is not interested in in only getting you to heaven, but he wants you to experience heaven here on earth. Amen. The Lord's prayer says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants you to experience the fullness of joy here. God wants you to experience deliverance here. God wants you to experience peace and restoration and forgiveness and and just God wants you to experience life in it more abundantly here on earth. That's what I'm saying. God is not just waiting or trying to get you to heaven. God wants you to experience everything heaven has here on earth. And the thing is, is that when it takes you laying down what you are feeding yourself for strength, it takes you laying down the desires of your own heart. You know, it it takes you laying down everything that you put your faith and your trust in. And now just keeping your eyes on Jesus, letting those things die, crucifying those things that feed your your flesh. And then you will experience a move of God like you never have. Like like Isaiah did here. He experienced a move of God like he never has. He saw God on a new level because he laid he the thing that he put his trust in died. Right. And we have to. Let those things die, amen, that we're putting our trust in, amen? So verses uh, 2 and 3, he didn't just see the Lord high and lifted up, but he saw angels. You know, above it, it stood the seraphims. You know, the the seraphims are an angel of fire, you know, and each had six wings. You know, when we wonder about, when we wonder about angels, you know, they have six wings. It tells us right here, it has six wings. Two is to cover their face, two is to cover their feet, and then... The other two is to fly. So we know that angels have a robe, right? So that it's just showing that the glory of God is so powerful that even angels have to shield themselves from it. And that same glory that angels have to shield themselves from can come into your heart. That same glory that angels had to shield themselves from can operate through your life to bring healing and deliverance to others. But you have to experience it for yourself first. You need to be delivered and healed first before you can bring healing and deliverance to someone else. You cannot pour out of a vessel that is not filled up. You know, and that's the thing. God wants you to experience the glory for yourself like Isaiah did here. So that you can be delivered for yourself so that you can bring healing and deliverance to someone else. And even, what did the angels do? They cried, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy was, you know, God talks once, twice, and and thrice. When he says it three times, it means it's a done deal. There's nothing that can come against that word when it's said three times. It is set in stone. It is official. And, And the angels cried, holy, 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 meaning God is truly holy at his purest form. It is what it is. He is holy. Right. And when the angels even cry out that the whole earth is full of his glory and the and it says in verse four, you know, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke. Amen. The the, the post of the door here is the entrance to the to the threshold. The door of the post here is the altar. Right. This is what gives you access to the mercy seat of God. And when 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 it says in the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, when you cry out to God in repentance, when you cry out that the Lord is holy, when you cry, it was at the cry that God was holy, 
Holy, holy is the Lord. That's now when they had access to the mercy seat of God. When you lay aside the thing that you're putting your strength in and you see God high and lifted up, you will know that he's truly holy. And when you cry out that holy is the Lord from a true place of believing that he's holy, you have now access to the mercy seat of God because you have now laid aside what you are operating out of. You have laid aside your flesh. You have laid aside yourself at this point and now your focus is shifted on God and his holiness. Your focus is now shifted on God to know that he is the one that truly is your strength and your refuge. And when you come to that place with God, you have now access to the mercy seat of God. And the, and the key to access to the mercy seat of God is repentance and humility. I truly believe that with my heart. And the ending of this says, and the house was filled with smoke. Amen. When you have access to the mercy seat of God and you come with humility, the house was filled with smoke. What that smoke is, it's God's consuming fire. So when you come to God in humility, laying aside everything that, 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 that feeds your flesh, when you lay aside your desires, when you lay aside your will, your dreams, everything that, when you lay aside your agenda, I'll say that. When you lay aside your agenda, God, you now have access to the mercy seat of God. And now God's consuming fire can come and bring you deliverance. Because now you have laid aside yourself, right? And now when you have access to the mercy seat of God, and let me tell you, Isaiah is seeing all this, right? So now Isaiah is experiencing the glory of God, right? He's seeing the angels cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The earth is full with his glory. Isaiah is seeing, you know, the mercy seat of God. He's seeing the he's seeing the 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 consuming fire of God. What does Isaiah say now? Then verse 5 says, "Then said I, this is Isaiah speaking, woe is me. I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For I, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The thing is, is that when you see God high and lifted up, when you see the holiness of God, you now see yourself. And the thing is, is that when you see God, you now see yourself, right? The Bible says in Genesis 126, let us make man in our image. So when you see God, you see yourself. You see, when you see God, you see the characteristics of God in your life that match his characteristics. But also, like Isaiah saw here, you also see the things that do not match with the will of God. You also see the characteristics that do not align with the will of God or the characteristics of God. When you, experiencing, when you experience God, you will see the true nature of yourself. And, and Isaiah saw God high and lifted up. And because he saw God, now he saw himself. So he laid aside his strength. Now he sees God. And now God is showing him more of himself. So this also shows that deliverance is an ongoing process. You know, once you lay one thing aside, God will also reveal other things that you need to work on. Because ultimately, the sanctification process is us being made more and more into the image of Christ until we come into perfection, until we come into the oneness of God, until we come into the true nature and image of God, that we will walk exactly as Jesus walked. And I don't know about you, but I don't walk as Jesus walks to the complete and perfection that Jesus did. I still get angry sometimes. I still get upset sometimes. I still sin. And this is where God is calling us is into perfection. And this is why we got to stay close to God, because when you stay close to God and you see God high and lifted up, he now reveal, he will reveal the hidden iniquities. He will reveal the things of your heart that do not match his character that he has for your life. And Isaiah said, woe is me for I am undone. Amen. He was a man of unclean lips, the Bible says, you know, and we know that Isaiah was a prophet. And what do prophets use? They use their words, you know. And through Isaiah seeing the Lord high and lifted up, he saw with himself that the words of his flesh, the words of his mouth in itself was, was unclean, 
right? The words in himself, the strength in himself, the gifts of his flesh and the gifts in itself was unclean. And the thing is, is that when we lay ourselves aside, we will realize when we are in the presence of God, we are nothing, right? When you are in the presence of God, you will realize the strength that you have is nothing. The calling in itself in your life is nothing. Your flesh is not. The Bible says this flesh profits nothing. You know, so when you are in the, 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 the presence of God, you will realize you in yourself are nothing. But God in himself is truly holy. And all power and all strength that we carry is because he is holy. And it's because he is righteous and it's because he is the one that gives us the strength, right? So talking about Isaiah and Isaiah is saying that he's a man of unclean lips. So I want to ask you today, just like I asked you before where your eyes were, I want to ask you now, where have your lips been? You know, are you, are we using our mouths to bring cursing or are we using our mouths to bring blessing? Are we using our mouths to gossip? Are we, are we using our words? Are we operating in our words out of hatred and anger and jealousy? You know, are we using our words and operating out of low self-esteem, out of, out of saying that we're not good enough, that we're never going to amount to anything? Where are your words positioned today? Because even as Isaiah realized that he was a man of unclean lips, I realized that I'm a man of unclean lips. And I truly dwell among people of unclean lips, especially what we're seeing taking place in, the, in our society today, we know that we truly dwell among a people of unclean lips, right? And so this, this should make us think. When you are close to God and you see God in high and lifted up, when you realize that God is holy, you, you start to examine yourself. What am, I, what am I putting my mouth on, you know? And the cool thing is, too, with this, is that all Isaiah had to do was confess that he was a man of unclean lips. That's all he had to do. All he had to do was confess that he was a man of unclean lips so that he could be forgiven. You know, and once he confessed it, it brought him deliverance. Because if we go on, it says, when he confessed that he was a man of unclean lips and he dwelt among a people on unclean lips, verse six says, then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongue, with the tongs from off the altar. And the angel laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged, right? So all it took was Isaiah confessing that he was a man of unclean lips. And the angel went to the altar of the Lord and took a coal from the altar of the Lord and brought it and cleansed it and put it on his lip, put it on the area where he was sinning, where he realized he was a sinner, then it was from the confession that brought him deliverance. And now the word said that his iniquity was taken away and his sin was purged. And that's all that it takes for us. Your deliverance today comes from your confession. Amen. Your cleansing comes from your repentance. Amen. You are purged through repentance today. And your iniquity is covered and by the blood of Jesus through your repentance. That's all that it takes. It takes you confessing that you are a sinner. Your re repentance is the key to your deliverance today. Amen. Repentance is always the key to deliverance. And we see here that all Isaiah had to do was repent of his sin. Amen. And the thing is, is now... So now we see it was the year King Uzziah died, right? It's the year. It's when we, when our, when our strength is killed, right? When we lay down our lives and, and sometimes things happen to us, not only when, not only you laying down your strength, you know what I mean? F not only you laying down your strength willingly, but even God allowing things to happen to you. Just like here, uh, Isaiah it was when Uzziah died, so it was something that happened to him, you know. That's then when he saw the Lord high and lifted up. So when an event happens, or when you lay down your strength, you know, physically, or emotionally, mentally, whatever you're putting your strength in, once you lay it down, now you see God for who he truly is, and now God shows you who you truly are. Now when you confess who you truly are when God shows you it, because let me tell you, God will show us our true nature sometimes too, and we don't take it seriously, right? 
So when God, tru when God truly shows you who you are, take it seriously and really think about who you really are. Am I truly living in this area for God? Right. So God showed Isaiah who he was because it wasn't until God saw Isaiah high and lifted up that he realized what was me for I'm uh, for I am undone and a man of unclean lips. So when God shows you who you are. But again, it takes us laying our strength down. It was the year King Uzziah died. It takes you killing the strength that's within you. That you find in the world, the things that are giving you strength that are not God, when that thing is laid down. When that thing dies, now you see that Lord high and lifted up. And when God shows you who you are, now you realize who you are. And now all it takes is you confessing. It takes you repenting in your heart. You know, Isaiah, Isaiah's heart matched his lips. That's the thing. Your heart has to match your lips. You have to, tr when you confess that uh, your sin, when you confess your faults, you have to truly believe it in your heart that you're repentant. Amen. Because the Bible also says in Matthew that they, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So we also have to realize that when we confess our sin to the Lord, our heart's posture has to match what we're saying. Right. And now Isaiah is delivered. Right. Isaiah is set free. Isaiah is purged. His iniquity is taken away. Now, we realize that his assignment now comes after submission and repentance. So Isaiah has now submitted to God. Isaiah has now repented. Isaiah has now been delivered. Now his assignment comes. So verses 8 and 9, you know, going on after it says, you know, his iniquity was taken away and his sin was purged. Verse 8 now says, also I heard the voice from the Lord saying, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then said, here I am. This is Isaiah saying. And he said, go and tell the people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. You know, make the heart of the, this people fat and make their ears heavy. And um, through verse 11, then said, then Isaiah said to the Lord, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitants. And the house is without a man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away. There shall be a great forsakening in the midst of the land. And the last scripture, verse 13. But yet in it shall be a tenth. And it shall return and be eaten as teal tree and as an oak, whose substance is in them. When they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be a substance thereof. I know that was a lot. We're going to break this down real quick. So verse 8 says, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and whom will go for us, right? So it was after his deliverance. And what did Isaiah say after that? Here I am, right? So it was after Isaiah's deliverance that his assignment was brought to him. So deliverance brings a confidence in you that you can do the will of God for your life, amen? When you lay down your strength, when you see God at his true nature, and when God reveals the hidden sins of your heart and the sins of your life and you confess them and you're now delivered, now God is getting you ready for your ministry. And now you have a new confidence in God that you're able to perform what God has called you to do. Because through deliverance brings intimacy. Through deliverance brings you to a new level of confidence in God and a new level of intimacy with God. And when you have a new level of intimacy with God, you have a new level of trust in him. Through, so through deliverance, through this deliverance and this sanctification process, now you are coming into a new level of intimacy with God that now will give you a new confidence that you're able to perform what God has called you to do. The question was just posed to, to, to Isaiah. The, the question wasn't even posed to Isaiah. It says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here I am. You know, God is saying, who is willing to go for me? Whom will go for us? Whom shall God send? And God wants us from our heart to say, here I am, God. I will go. But you will not have that confidence to go unless you go through deliverance. Unless you lay down your life. Unless you see God for who he is. Because how do you see God for who he is? 
You're trusting solely in the word of God. You're not, you're not dictating your life based on what you see in the natural. You're taking your eyes again off of what you see in the natural. And now you're putting your eyes on what you see in the supernatural. This is how you now see God. This is how now you're prepared for ministry. This is how now you will go through the deliverance process. It's you taking your eyes off of the things of the earth and now putting your eyes on God. You know? And God will vindicate you through your deliverance. You know, Isaiah's mouth was cleansed. So now that his lips were cleansed, now he could be a major prophet to the nations. To prophesy to Judah until the end of his days. You know, and Isaiah was one was the major prophet in the time. You know, because in those times they had major a major prophet and then they had a minor prophet. The minor prophets were just regular prophets that would prophesy. But there was always one major prophet for the land that would prophesy to the region. And Isaiah was the major prophet in that time. And now because his lips was cleansed, now he was the major prophet. And he did not just prophesy to Judah, but he prophesied the coming of the Messiah. He prophesied Jesus. You know, Isaiah 61, Isaiah 11, all these script, all these scriptures was Isaiah prophesying, you know, the coming of the Messiah, but it started with his deliverance. Amen. And this task, and if you realize here, as we read eight, eight through 13, we realize that God gave Isaiah not an easy task. You know, the words here in verses eight through 13, it said that they have ears, but they will not hear. You know, God's call to repentance. They will have, um, they, they would not, they'll be blinded to their sin, you know, and their, uh, their ears would be deaf to the call of repentance. And, you know, the thing is for you today, God may be calling you to a ministry, but it's, it may not be easy. You know, through your deliverance, you're going to realize that your ministry is not going to be easy, you know? And sometimes God will give you a task that's setting you up for rejection. He let Isaiah know ahead of time, these people, ain't gonna, these people are not going to accept you. These people will, will hear you, but they're not going to accept you. They're, they're going to hear the call for repentance, but they're not going to accept you. This is what ministry is. You know, we are to be rejected for Jesus. You know, we know not everyone is going to receive what we're saying, but we are to still go. Amen. Whatever God has called you to do, you go because you, again, you have that confidence in who God is in you. And when you, God tells you to go, you go, regardless on if people are going to reject you or not, you go and be in the will of God. Because what if someone does, re what if someone does accept you? What if someone does accept the will and, and the, um, the, the call for repentance that you're bringing to them, you know, and that's the thing. Your deliverance is going to set you up, not always for good things, but it will even set you up for a ministry that you'll be rejected. But you're doing all unto the Lord and you're spreading the good news and you're laying seeds in lives that, that God will water in his time. Amen. And, you know, we all know the scripture in Revelation, you know, 12, 11, that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And the thing is, is that your deliverance will bring deliverance to somebody else. Even though it may be hard, even though you may be rejected, God is calling you to be delivered so that you can use your testimony to bring deliverance to someone else. And the thing is, is that you will stand in what you believe once you're secure in who you are. That's what God spoke to me today. You will stand in what you believe once you're secure in who you are. Isaiah knew he was going to be rejected, but he could stand and he took the assignment that God gave him because he was secure in who God was. And you're secure in who God is in you through your deliverance, through who Jesus is in you. That is who makes you secure. You are secure in who you are in God through intimacy. You are secure in who you are through Jesus Christ that comes in and lives in your heart. Amen. So, you know, the whole topic of today is, is about strength, right? So, you know, I want to pose a question to you, you know, in the beginning, you know, we started off about talking about your strength dying. And the strength of your flesh dying and the things of the world that give you strength, those things dying, you know, and now taking up the strength of God. You know, the strength, the, the question, though, is when you get weary and when you get tired, how do we renew your strength in the Lord instead of going back to the things that once did give you strength? Because how many of us have been there? 
You know, we 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 laid aside our sin. We laid aside things that gave us strength. You know, we laid aside substances and things like that. And then we go through life and then life gets tough and we feel like we don't have the strength of the Lord. So now we go back to those things. So the thing is, is the question I want to ask is how can we renew our strength in God? Well, we know that Isaiah 40, 31 says that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Waiting on God is the key to renewing your strength. Waiting. And let me tell you, that is tough. Waiting on God is tough, but waiting exercises your faith. Waiting puts your trust into action. When you wait on God, God is, you are showing God and you're declaring on your life that I'm, I may not feel strength, but I am more confident in God and who God is in me that I'm confident in a false strength that is given to me by the world. And when you wait on God, God is going to intervene, you know? You know, we are not to go back to the false comfort of the world because what will happen is that we will inherit trouble. Because the Bible says when you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. So when we go back to the world to gain strength, we are going to reap havoc. We're going to reap confusion. We're going to reap trouble. And also, we're going to fall out of that place of intimacy that we once had with God. And I don't want to fall out of intimacy with God, you know. And the thing is, is that waiting on God is key, you know. When you do all that you can do, like I said earlier, you just stand, right? And God has stripped those things off of you for a reason. God has stripped those things that you put strength in for a reason. So that you can fully rely on him. And what you can do as you wait is declare the word of God over yourself. Because it's faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And you have to have faith to wait on God. So whilst you're waiting, you have to have faith. And if faith comes by hearing, you declare the word of God over your life so that you can hear the word, so that you can have faith, and now you can wait on your faith because you heard the word of God. Does it make sense? So scriptures, what can you say to renew your strength? Nehemiah, what I said 8.10 earlier, that the joy of the Lord is my strength. That's something you can declare over yourself. Proverbs 46, 1 through 3. God is my refuge and my strength, my ever-present help in time of trouble. You know, Exodus 15, 2. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in a habitation. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. You know, uh, uh, Isaiah 40, 29. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. These are all things that you can do whilst you're waiting on strength. Because let me tell you, you're not always going to feel strong. You know, you're not always going to. Let me tell you, for me, there's times where I'm like on a high with God and I feel like Superman. I feel like the Hulk. I feel strong and I feel like, God, come on, let's conquer the world. Then there's days I'm like, I'm tired, you know, but you in those days that you feel tired, instead of going back to the world, stand on your faith. Declare the word of God over your life. Declare that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Declare scriptures. Look up scriptures about strength. Look up scriptures about faith and hope and joy and all those things. And read those scriptures out loud so that you can hear them. So it can bring you faith. So you can stand and wait on the Lord in your faith. And as you wait on God, he will renew your strength. And you will mount up on wings as eagles and you will run and not be weary and you will walk and not faint. Amen. You will walk and not faint. You are not called to faint. Amen. So we are not to go back to the world's strength. We are not to go back to the world's tactics. But we are to stay the course. Amen. God says he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So let's seek the Lord today for strength and watch the salvation of the Lord. Amen. Because I truly believe we are entering into a time of of greatness in God and we cannot be entangled in the affairs of this world amen but we are to be fully committed to the will of God and the work of God and the plan of God for our lives that the will of God for our lives should overpower and 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 the will of God for our lives should trump what whatever desire we have for this world whether it's a desire to make money whether it's a desire to you know, do ministry, whether it's a desire to, because when I talk about ministry and things like that, sometimes we put more trust in the works 
in ministry than we do in trusting God and really believing God. And and whatever it is, whatever desires you have in the natural realm, I'm not telling you to just, if you have goals and things in this world, I'm not telling you to just lay them all down, but submit them to God. Do not let them be over the will of God for your life. Make sure they are in submission to the will of God. Because a lot of times we have dreams and stuff like that, and then we put God on the back burner. But no, God says, when you delight in him, he will give you the desires of your heart. So you have to delight in him first before he can give you the desires of your heart. And sometimes the desires of your heart ain't even God's desires for you. So the reality is, is that when you come into that intimacy with God, now what happens is your desires start to change. And now your desires become his desires. And now he will grant you with the desires he had already had for you from the jump. And, you know, going back to what we started with, you know, we have to lay aside our strength. Lay aside, and a lot of times we do things out of our own strength. We try to conquer addictions out of our own strength. We try to co um, bring families back together out of our own, out of our own strength. We, we try to do ministry out of our own strength and then we get weary and tired. Why? Because we are taking up our own strength instead of submitting our strength to the will of God. Instead of seeing God high and lifted up and, and his train fill the temple and his glory fill the temple, instead of seeing God, we are seeing ourselves through our own strength. And that's the thing. We cannot see a situation out of our own strength, but we have to see God as high and lifted up. And when we see God as high and lifted up, that means we are seeing him as number one position in our lives to know that the strength that I possess is from God. Amen. So as we go into 2021, lay aside everything that gave you strength before and now see God as high as lifted up. See, God is the one who is your strength today. Amen. So I love you all. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for this message, God. And I just pray over everybody right now under the sound of my voice, God, that you would give them the strength of the Lord, God. I release the joy of the Lord over everyone to be their strength right now, God. And I pray you reveal the hidden iniquities of our hearts, God. And reveal to us the things that we are putting our trust in that gives us strength. That is not you. So we can command those things to die. Just as King Uzziah died, God, and you saw the Lord high and lifted up. And Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, God. We pray that as we see those things die in our lives that once gave us strength, now we're able to see you as high and lifted up. And God, Lord, let the, so that the train of the glory of God can fill the temple God, so that we, the glory of God can come fill our temple, God, that it can expose the darkness, it can dis expose the sin in our lives, God, so that when it's exposed, we can repent of it, God, and that you can deliver us, cleanse us, purge us, and that now we can be ready for the assignment, the will, the call that you have for our lives. God, we thank you, and we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, love y'all. See y'all next week.